So the last talk in this uh, session is by um, Sergei Veselbitsky. Mm -hmm. um, sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, it's uh, with respect to dealing with massive data parallelism to the rescue. So uh, this is based on joint work with uh, Howard, Sylvia, Ben, Sid, and the conversations that are included at least half a dozen people that are in this room. And unlike the previous talk, I'm really, which really showed us that even at small scales of say 18 monks talking to each other, hard problems are hard to solve. What I'm gonna focus on is that at web scales, you know, the usual kind of usual to us examples of billions of emails per day, as Mucha said, tens of billions of auctions per day, even really simple questions become hard, right? So even asking a question that says, what are the most popular search queries? Or looking at a Facebook graph and saying, is there really a path of six degrees of separation between these two? Or is there, t is there a path of 15 degrees of separation between these two particular nodes? Is something that's not as trivial as maybe we would like. But of course we have lots of computers. Right, so if we go back a few years, now I have this laptop, I have an iPhone that sits in my pocket that's probably as powerful as computers were 10 years ago, it has more memory, it has just more hard drive space, it has just as much RAM, and there's plenty of parallel algorithms that have been, been developed throughout the years. There's one problem with these, and a parallel programming is hard. There's this great, not so great, but there's an article on the web that's sort of entitled Why Threads Suck. And it goes to this point that we're all smart enough, we can write multi-threaded programming if we were forced to. But it's just not an exercise that we definitely want to go through. Right, so it's very hard to test. There's this method of non-determinism, and just because you ran your program once and it worked, means absolutely nothing. Uh, it means maybe you don't have something completely obvious and ridiculous as a mistake, but it doesn't really mean that it's going to work again. And if it worked 10 times, it doesn't really mean that it's going to work once I actually have a load on the system and I need this multi-threaded as opposed to where I started. Um, they're very difficult to read and reason about. So when I'm reading a piece of code, then I have to say, okay, what is the data that's being executed by this particular piece of code? Who else has access to it? How do I prevent kind of race conditions or overrides? I need to think about synchronization and all of these issues. Right? It's not to say that it's impossible. It's definitely not impossible. We can all do it. It's not too hard. Um, but it's just a pain. I don't want to be doing this daily. Right? And the other kind of side of the coin of what makes parallel programming hard is that more machines or more CPUs or more anything usually means more breakdowns. Right? So taking a simple kind of back of the envelope calculation, if we have a set of machines whose mean time to failure is one year, and I have a thousand of these, that means three of them will be breaking per day, right? If I have 10,000 of these, that means one of them will be breaking every single hour. On average, so some hours I'll be happy and I'll get some sleep, and some hours five of them will break. Right? And now as a programmer, if my code is running for more than an hour, I have to deal with this. Is, this still going to, is the machine still going to be there? Is there, do I need to care about and monitor it, whether it's gonna come back to life, whether it died, what happened to it, do I need to restart the task, and so on, and so on, and so on. Right, and this is yet one more thing that I really don't want to be worrying about. This is best done once and for all. Somebody who's better than me at it could do it, and I can just focus on doing what I'm good at. So this is where uh, MapReduce has come in, and MapReduce says, really, let somebody else do a lot of this boilerplate. Right? It's going to track the jobs, it's gonna restart the jobs as needed, it's gonna look at the data and say, oh, where should this data live? Is it, parallel? Is it distributed? Is it backed up? And so on and so forth. And you just do what you need to do. You write the code that needs to run in parallel and we'll take care of the background work for you. But again, sort of as with most things in life, there's no free lunch. So you can't do arbitrary kinds of parallelization. You have to say, I can do some kinds of parallelization, but not others. So what is this kind of mysterious or not so mysterious map reduce? So there's two parts to it. The first major change from before is that data now is not a single bit at a time, but data is really represented as pairs. So there's a key and there's a value. 
So we can take a graph, which is simply a list of edges. I'm not going to look at it as a matrix. I'm going to look at it as a long list. And so here, key might be the endpoints of the graph, u and the v. And the value is the weight of the graph. So now we have a directed weighted graph. We can assume that it's undirected. And so here, we have a little graph, five nodes, five edges, four nodes. And we just have somewhere in random order. Again, there's no ordering on these things, sitting five key value pairs. Now, what can we do with these? So here's how MapReduce works in a picture that fits on one slide. So we start with a bunch of unordered data, right, sitting somewhere in the cloud. It might not be. It might be on your hard drive. But it's just unordered. You can't assume anything about it. What you do in the map phase is you say, I'm going to have different partitions of this data. And I'm going to look at every key value one at a time. And I'm going to say, which partitions do I want to send it to? Right, so here I might look at this UV and 3, and I say, well, it really belongs in the first and the third partition. I might look at a different key value of x, w, and 1, and say it belongs in the second and the fourth. And I can do this one at a time. Then the system comes in, and it says, OK, let me actually shuffle and move the values to where you said they should be. Right? And here I've attached the label to each one of these, and this is the key that's representing these values. But the way to think about it is to say I've separated the data, and I want each one to be handled separately. The reduce step now takes a key, all of the values associated with it, and does something. Here's what we've done. It's just we've added all of the values associated with a single key. And now these go back to this cloud of unordered data. Right? And so I started with this. I ended with this. So I can now repeat this again if I wanted to. I can make a second round, third round, whatnot. Um, but what have we done? What we've really done is we've started with this graph, and we've just computed uh, the weighted degrees of every single node that's in there. And that's the little task that we've accomplished. Now, why is this nice? So the map task, again, I said every key value pair, you have to work on it one at a time. Right? So I can parallelize these if I want to. What I do on one key value pair is independent data-wise of the other key value pair. So there's no need for them to be on the same machine. They could be done in distributed fashion. The shuffle is what's done by the system. This is the synchronization step that actually munges all the data and says, you should go here, you should go there, and how we're going to deal with it. And then the reduce, again, kind of pictorially was the easiest way to see it, is that the reduce worked on each one of the data blocks separately. So there wasn't, again, any need for cross-communication. I can do all of the different reduced parts in parallel overall. And what MapReduce does for us is that the first is, is provided by the programmer. So I just have to say, given a key value pair, what do I want to do with it? Everything else in the shuffle is provided by the system. And the reduce is also provided by the programmer. So given a key and a bunch of values associated with it, what do I want to do? What is my computation? What do I want to compute? And the system, thankfully, does absolutely everything else. Right? It reads the data. It writes the data. It says, oh, this machine went down. Or it didn't really go down, but it's not responding. It's been running for two and a half hours. Maybe something's wrong with it. Let me restart it and restart this particular sub job on a different task. I'm going to keep track of all the different map jobs that I have. I'll keep track of all the reduce jobs that I have. And you, as long as you've provided the map and the reduce, you just sit there and wait. And eventually, you'll get the answer that you want. Right, so at a high level, it's really about the data view. It's about saying, let's have this huge computation that we have and partition it into logically different pieces of data so that I can perform my computation on each piece of data that I have. And this is a sequential computation now, something that we're familiar with. And then I'll put it all together. So this is what it is. Um, lest you think that this is mostly about theory or it's used by kind of a couple of companies out there, it's used left and right. So it's not surprising that Google, which invented MapReduce, is using it. Yahoo, which wrote the open source versions, using it. Amazon, which is providing a free access to a cluster. And if you want any of your students, you can email them and they give you Amazon credits, is using it. Twitter is using it. But maybe a little bit more surprising, New York Times using it left and right to do some of their data analysis. Uh, JP Morgan's using it for financial data. eHarmony is actually running a nightly script 
to do the matching and to say who should be dating whom. So when you get an email in the morning, eHarmony is using this actually on Amazon. Uh, Booz Allen's doing it for their consulting work and so on and so on and so on. The list is actually quite long. Uh, as I said, the code is available, the services are available, so Amazon charges under a dollar per, per hour to run MapReduce jobs, so you just go and you can try it out. Um, it's pretty good. The problem with this is that most of the algorithms, especially the algorithms that are out there in the wild, are really just the easy adaptations of what we know how to do. Right? So the prototypical example of MapReduce, which you'll see, is word count which is to say I have this huge corpus, maybe it's all the emails I've seen in the past few months, so it's a few terabytes, give me a distribution of all the words. Okay. This is very easy for it. For every word you just have to count how many times it appears. This is an easily parallelizable task. Um, I just showed you degree distribution, right? This is almost as easy as it gets. There are a couple more caveats, but that's easy, etc. And there's a problem here of whether this is a chicken or an egg problem, right? So are we doing these simple algorithms because that's the only thing we want to do? Or are we doing these simple algorithms because that's the only thing we know how to do? And the answer is not completely clear. And I think it's a little bit of both. So you can come to me and you can say, oh, Sergey, but what about all these other things we've worked on over the past couple of decades, right? What about streaming? And streaming captures this fact that we have massive data, so it doesn't, your whole data set does not fit into memory. Right? You can't go through it many times, it's just flying by you one step at a time. But it doesn't really talk about parallelism. Right? And some of the streams can parallelize easily, some of the sketches you can parallelize and they add together, and some of them do not. What about PRAMs? We love PRAMs. Right? Polynomial number of processors, lots of algorithms developed about them. Shared memory, not really the right architecture here, and shared memory is really hard to get by. Right? You really do have to care about kind of caches and multi-level memory hierarchies because it's really not the same thing as reading the memory that's local to your cache or local to your memory or local to your disk or reading across the network. All of these things have different parameters. And this is why we have BSP. So BSP is block synchronous parallel. It does exactly this. It has a set of parameters for all of the trade-offs, and you can come up with absolutely optimal algorithms for whatever different level of parallelization that you have. But there are very many parameters, and there are not that many algorithms. So Les will tell you that there's some things that you can do optimally, but there's many other things we don't really know how to do in this model. So you can say, well, Sergey, no, really, you've been a little glib here. Uh, we did a, really a lot of work on streaming. We did a lot of work on PRMs. Can't we use any of this? Right? And with streaming, again, as I said before, some of these sketches combine. So a lot of the counting sketches, for example, you can distribute and combine back because you're just doing additions and subtra subtractions. There's not much there. With PRMs, which come the closest and are sort of at the core of a lot of the parallel literature, we can do two things. We can say formally we can simulate a lot of the PRAM algorithms in MapReduce. And this is a formal statement. You can write a theorem with the right parameters. But more often the intuition that comes behind the PRAMs is the right one. You can say, oh, you know, this is the way I should think about it in parallel. And then I can get by and I, I'm not going to simulate PRAM because that's wasteful, but I'm going to do the same kind of thing. The downside is that as PRAMs usually take about log n rounds to run, then your MapReduce, which are based on PRAMs, will usually take about log n rounds to run. And the MapReduce round is really on more on the expensive side of things. It's not a cheap thing because there's a lot of data being moved around. So this is not maybe as desirable as we can, as we want to be, but this is definitely a stake in the ground. This is a baseline that you have to compare yourself to. <coughs> and for BSP, as I said, there's really a dearth of algorithms out there. There's not much that we know how to do in the BSP. So here's just a quick example as kind of how different uh, of these different ways of dealing with the massive data deal with the, really is it the simplest question out there. So I have n numbers and I want to compute the sum. Right? As simple as it gets. So if I'm streaming, what do I do? I keep one counter. Every time a number goes by, I add it to the counter and I continue. Really just 
really is the simplest stream that you can have out there. If you're doing PRAMs, what do you do? Well, you envision that there is a binary tree, say, on all of these numbers, and you just walk up the tree and you're summing all of these things at a time, right? So you say, let me sum up the first two, let me sum up the third and the fourth, the fifth and the sixth, and so on and so forth. Now I have half as many elements, I just recurse, and this is where we get our log n rounds. In the end, I'm done. But MapReduce here, you can do a little bit more. You're basically saying, I'm gonna do the same thing as I did with the PRAMs, only instead of looking at two elements at a time, I'm gonna look at more elements. And if particularly if I look at root n elements at the time, then I'm done in two rounds. Right? So maybe not a huge difference between here and here, but a constant number of rounds, conceptually the same thing, but I do get, I will finish faster. And if you actually implement these, this will be faster than this, based on what I know. And of course, the stream, you can maintain now separate streams and do almost the same thing as here. So in the sense, the distributed sum is an easy problem to see the differences, but you can adapt each one of the solutions to the other. So let's take the same approach here that we're using kind of in MapReduce and to some extent to PRAM of just randomly splitting the data, doing something on each one of the partitions, and then combining it back. Right, so we're calling these filtering, and this is filtering via random partitions. We're gonna randomly split, we're gonna combine the intermediate answers, and we're gonna compute the final answers on a single machine. This is exactly what we did with the sum. Right, I split the sum, I computed subsets, and then I compute the final one. Now the nice thing is that, again, this is trivial for sums. This works for other data structures where it's not obvious at first, but gets obvious once you think about it for a little bit. So the same thing works for connected components, right? So I have a large, dense graph. I partition the edges, and I just remember basically the union find data structure. I remember a tree representing each one of the subgraphs because I care about connectivity, and that's enough. So I might go from n squared edges, if I'm in a really dense subgraph, to n minus one edges. So I've pruned out a lot of the edges that were there, and now I can recurse and do this again. Uh, the same thing works for minimum spanning trees. That's not kind of hard to see. The same idea works for clustering, and this is adapting some of the work that was done on clustering in the streaming model, that you can cluster the points individually and then you cluster the clusters. Yes, you lose another factor of two, maybe two and a half, or depending on what exactly the formula and the objective is, but it does work. It gets you along the way there. But what if you wanted to do matchings? And so let's start, I'm giving you an undirected graph, and I say, let's find the maximum matching in this graph. I say, well, maximum maybe is a little too hard. Let's start easier. Let's find a maximal matching in this graph. With streaming, we know exactly how to do this. Right? This is very easy again. I maintain the nodes, and I look at the edges coming in one at a time. And then if the edge fits so that both of its nodes are unmatched, I put it in. I mark the nodes as matched, and I continue on my merry way. Right. So what if I do here? If I do this random partitions approach, it's kind of weird. It's not going to get me very far. right? So I find a matching on each partition, and then I combine them back together, and then I somehow find a matching of the matchings. And you should be cringing at this point. Right? Because I have threw out a lot of edges. I don't know what to do with them. Maybe I should put them back in. I don't really know how much progress I'm going to make from one step to the next. Okay. And this is not definitely, it's definitely not the PRAM way of doing matches, either maximum matches. But here's our main idea. We're gonna say, well, let's find a seed matching. Let's take a sample, take some smaller subgraph. Let's find a seed matching on that subgraph. And then I can remove a whole lot of things because I'm looking for a maximal that are not, that are conflicting with the seed matching that I have. And then I'll recurse on the remaining edges. So with a lack of coffee, best done in pictures, here's my graph, uh, 12 edges, eight nodes. So I'm gonna take a random sample. So some of these will disappear. Now I find a maximal matching on this sample. And I'll find, you know, maybe there is a better one, but I have this edge here and the edge on the flip side. Now I look at the original graph, here it is. I remove all of the edges that are now in conflict gone. And now I have a much smaller graph remaining, right? Now if I, only these two edges, only these two nodes and the two edges between them 
or anything I care about. So I find a matching in the remaining ones. I just pick one of the two, and I'm done. Simple to describe. You should be saying, OK, but how well does this work? How big of a sample do you need in the beginning? So here's a lemma that we can prove that so due to the promise of no Greek letters, I will not actually prove for you here. But the proof fits in the remaining of the slide, if we wanted to. Um, so say the sampling rate is some number, so slightly more than the number of nodes, n to the 1 plus c, over the number of edges m. Then the number of edges remaining goes down by a factor of p every single time. And this is not trivial, because here I'm sampling, and this is the number of edges I look at. And now I'm saying that this is exactly the fraction that will be remaining as I go forward. And this leads to easy corollary. So if I have super linear memory, then I finish in constant number of rounds. If I have about n log n memory, I still break the PRAM barrier of log n, not by much. It's a log n over log log n, but I can get a little bit under it, so, which tells me that this is something better, this is something more powerful than a regular PRAM. I can do a little bit more here. And the PRAM simulations have their own advantages. Yes, they take a little bit longer in terms of number of rounds, but the rounds themselves are very simple because you're basically looking as an edge, you're saying, oh, am I going to go with my left endpoint or the right endpoint? And then each vertex is going to say, oh, I have a lot of edges that want to go with me. Let me just pick one. And I recurse and I repeat. And now you can prove that you get sort of a constant every single time. So this is nice for theory, but does it actually work? So here's a small example. So for us small, about 44 gigs uncompressed. This is a subset of Twitter, so about 3 billion edges, 50 million nodes. Right? Not too large. The running time is on the y-axis. The sampling probability is on the x-axis. The red dashed line is the streaming implementation, which really just said, let me take an edge, see if it fits. If it fits, add it. If it doesn't fit, let me take the next edge. And then the blue line is the parallel implementation. And the probability p is the sampling probability that we use in the first step. And this was just run for two rounds. So here is about 85 minutes, just due to reading the whole data sequentially. Here we can drop it down to 20 easily and maybe down to about 15. One thing to note is that if we don't do any sampling and we just run the same streaming algorithm on the full data but through the MapReduce infrastructure, we get about 3x blow up in the speed, right? So it's not free. The parallelism doesn't come for free. It's not the same as just doing it locally. You do have to pay for all the boilerplate that happens. But if you do it wisely, you can get a speed up here. So this was about, this is a great point. This, this was 50 machines. So you can say you're getting a 4x maybe speed up with 50 machines. This is not great, right? But you should really be kind of so a lot of the data shuffling that you're doing in between, it's not the computation, it's communication. communication. Yeah. Right. So you should be saying, you know, you told me that you can do maximal matching on this graph. Well, maybe you can do it in 15 minutes. That's kind of pathetic. Right? This is not a great result. 15 minutes for a matching? I want a matching to be done at 30 seconds. Right? I really want it to be done sub one second, but maybe I'll wait 30. 15 minutes is kind of, it's too long. And so can we do better? So we're all familiar with Moore's Law. And Moore's Law initially said, Moore's Law really says the number of transistors doubles every 18 months. If you look on the Intel website, it says every 24. I've never seen 24. I've always heard of it as 18. Maybe I'm in the wrong. Um, initially, this translated to an increase in CPU speeds. Right? Initially, we thought twice the number of transistors twice as fast in terms of the clock speed. And you know, if we go back to the 90s and the early 2000s, we had the CPU wars. And we started with like the Pentium 166s, I think, were the first ones. Then we went to 133s, and that was amazing. We went to 200s, it's crazy. We hit the gigahertz, and we went to 4 gigahertz. And then we sort of slowed down, because the energy consumption is way too high, and we can't really sustain it, right? So, now it translates in terms of the number of cores. So now we have more and more cores using this. So, but what does this mean? Well, we can use the same multi-threaded approaches, but we can go back and say, this is why multi-threaded is hard. 
There's a lot of parallelism. It's very hard to think about and to reason about. But what's important in these multi-core approaches, it's again data locality, right? I want to work on something that's local in my own cache. I don't want to go across the network or across to the main memory. And this is sort of exactly what MapReduce does. And we weren't the first ones to think about this. So there's a paper from 2007 where they said, let's take the MapReduce infrastructure. Let's take the same paradigm of Map and Reduce, but let's run it on a multi-core machine instead. So every core is its own single machine. Now I'm just looking at memory. I'm not going, I don't have a lot of these network issues because my memory bandwidth is a lot higher. And they really do say that overall, this is a good model. So if you carefully implement it, this is the right model for multi-core computing. So as we're running way behind, let me just leave you with the following kind of two notes. So the 80s are back, uh, at least in terms of parallel computing, in terms of a lot of fashion trends also, uh, but we're here. So we had a, a multi-core and parallelism workshop in this very room a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago now, and there was one person who came back and said, the last time I had this workshop, and here are my slides, were from 1986. And I was in DIMAX talking about parallelism in 1986. Now we're here in 2011, we're talking about parallelism again. So the 80s are back, and so is parallelism, and so is like our need to think about parallelism. But 2011 is not 1986. Right? We're not looking at PRAMs, we're looking at MapReduce, we're looking at multi-core. And that's the parallelism of today. And so with that, I'll stop for questions. I Well, I was expecting you, so you, you say this story where you go, oh, I didn't get the speed up, I was hoping 50 CPUs to get four times speed up. But the problem is the communication, and this stuff is all going to work great when we have our multi-core things. And now we have, you know, four cores, six cores, eight cores. I was expecting your next slide was going to be MapReduce implemented on a single chip using multiple cores. Where is that slide? <laughs> they, they did it. I haven't done it. Okay. So that slide is sort of in the making. So I know what they did, and this is a nice paper. Um, and they did exactly this, and they said, Let, let's do word count. And let's do word count using the MapReduce way, but let's use it on multi-core, and let's have our kind of Hadoop and MapReduce implementation really just running, be a multi-threaded implementation on a single chip. And they achieve almost a 4x speed up. Sometimes they actually claim that they had a bigger speed up than the number of cores because of cache locality. So one last question, go ahead. So there's an oft-quoted uh, report from I think six months ago that said, Google is giving up on MapReduce, they're moving to something else. And they, they ask half the people that say, yes, yes, Google is good on MapReduce, it's just a, it's a fad, it's past its day, it's gone now. If you ask the other half, say, no, 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 Google is still using MapReduce, people don't know what they're talking about. So I guess my question is, from our point of view of this workshop, right, uh, what we might draw from MapReduce, so it's not MapReduce per se, but some kind of notion of, of, of uh, architecture that encapsulates. Which we, with, for PRAM, we have a solution of sort of circuits, right? There's a mm -hmm. kind of get to the circuit, how long does it take? And you don't care how many processes you throw the problem, it's fine. With data streams, you have a notion of low, low memory and loop ahead, where you have some sort of memory, you want to store what you can and do what you can with it. And that sort of transcends, you know, the actual applications. And so in MapReduce, right, what is the transcendent message that goes beyond Hadoop or whatever you want? Know? So the tr to me, the message is about data locality. And the message, it's not crisp yet to the point that it is in streaming to the point that it was in PRAMs. But the point is that you can have a small subset of the data that's local that you can work on separately from everything else. And then you have a synchronization step and then you can separate again. And this is the nature of the game. Because then I as a programmer, as a user of the system can think about it very easily. I know who's gonna touch this data, who's not gonna touch this data, where it lives, et cetera, right? And it's about saying, if I can break up my data in a lot of little pieces, and then each piece is small enough, it's not as big as the whole data set. I don't care about how many pieces I break it into, but there are a lot of little, maybe overlapping pieces, maybe not, and then I bring them together. Can I do things in one round? Can I do things in two rounds? Do I need log n rounds, right? How, can, how far can I get away with not looking at the full data set together, but looking at the full data set in a distributed fashion? 
and do it there. How, can, how far can I get away with not looking at the full data set together, but looking at the full data set in a distributed fashion and do it there? 